Hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, to uh, this month's KeyShot webinar. I'm uh, Josh Mings, Director of Marketing here at Luxion. Today uh, we have a very special guest presenter, Ed Ferguson of Cascadia Design Studio. Uh, Cascadia was founded in 2000, it's just north of Seattle, Washington. And Ed designs, fabricates, and sells custom made-to-order titanium rings. They're absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, best of all to us, he creates all those images using KeyShot, and today he's going to break down that process, what he goes through uh, to create them, and show you uh, what makes uh, jewelry unique from uh, rendering or photographing other items. Now, uh, any questions along the way, just ask them over there in the questions area. We have uh, Rex and Sean on, and I'll be there as well, and uh, we'll answer your questions or ask Ed to, to show us. So with that, Ed, take it away, good sir. Okay, uh, thank you everybody and welcome. It's a sunny day here in Seattle, so let's get started. Um, the um, topics I'm going to go over are uh, basic model preparation and import, uh, metal and jewelry materials, lighting and cameras, export and post-production and along the way I'll sprinkle in some uh, tips and tricks and techniques that I've learned along the way. Uh, this model uh, is a free one that I got off of GrabCAD. Uh, there's the URL on the screen if you want to uh, have a go at the same model. Um, this is the finished render that I worked up and I picked this particular model because I think it is especially challenging because of all of the large reflective areas. We've got uh, large flowing uh, platinum uh, areas that are reflecting light in every direction. It's a bit like a, a funhouse mirror. And it's, it's a challenge uh, to work up your lighting uh, to make this work out. Uh, most photographers, especially jewelry photographers, will tell you that the most challenging part of uh, taking any image is going to be the lighting. So that's where uh, I spent a lot of time on this particular model. And in this scene, I was going for what I call the catalog look. If you do a search, say, on platinum bands, uh, look at Google Images, you'll see a lot of catalog shots of these types of rings. And typically, they're uh, on a light background and um, controlling reflections, again, is, is very difficult. Um, Here's an example of one image uh, I took. Uh, this is from a very uh, well-known uh, jeweler. Um, and this is their catalog look, if you will. And you can see that I tried to uh, do a little bit of reverse engineering here by picking out the, the tone of the metal. They, they tend to give their uh, metals a bit of a, a cool uh, blue look, and so I was trying to uh, emulate that a little bit. Now, what makes jewelry uh, unique or, or different from most subjects when you're doing photography or making a render is that jewelry is normally a macro shot, uh, so it's a close-up, and that means any flaws in the model or the lighting are difficult to hide. Uh, so, um, you know, you're taking an extreme close-up, so detail matters here. Also, jewelry is usually the only subject in the scene. Uh, sometimes there might be other props, but generally for catalog shots like this, the ring or piece of jewelry is the only item, and it's typically, again, on a white background. Um, also, again, jewelry is highly reflective, and so unwanted reflections are very distractive. 
and you can see in this particular catalog shot, uh, they did some post work, I'm sure, on the inside of the ring uh, to get rid of any distracting reflections. They want the eye to go to the stones at the top, not the bottom of the band. And also on jewelry, uh, blown out areas are common. You'll see a lot of areas that um, are approaching pure white, uh, you know, what you call blown out. And in most scenes, that's something you want to avoid. But in jewelry, uh, blown out areas are acceptable as long as they're not, you know, too extreme. But to tell the eye that this is a sparkly, shiny object, you expect to see a, a few blown out areas. And so generally, that's, that's going to be OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, reflections. Now here's my uh, 1950 Buick Super Wagon. And you can see that we've got this large chrome bumper that's reflecting everything. You can see the lights in the ceiling. You can see the photographer on the floor taking the photo. Um, in this kind of a shot, you expect these kind of reflections. You can't avoid them. Jewelry, on the other hand, uh, these kinds of reflections would be highly distractive. And so we have to make special effort to minimize and control those reflections, but at the same time have enough reflections to tell you that this is a shiny, sparkly uh, piece of jewelry. Now, if your jewelry has tight, small radius areas like this one, it's a little easier of a job because your reflections, as you can see in this photograph, the reflections have been condensed, and they only show up as black lines, uh, bright white lines. Um, because of the nature of the geometry, the small radius areas, you're not getting those broad reflections like you were on the, on the Buick bumper. So this kind of an object is a bit easier uh, of a task. But again, I chose something that had broad, sweeping, reflective areas, a little more of a challenge. Here's some photographs of uh, rings taken off of the web. And you can see on the top row of three rings, there's highly reflective uh, areas in the uh, ring interior. And uh, for example, this one on the upper left, you can see these reflections that are caused by the photographer's soft box. And that's the large light box that they use for photography. It's always going to show up on the ring interior on a shot like this. The one in the center, uh, much more complex. Uh, there's a lot going on there with reflection. The one on the right looks like it might have been taken with a cell phone uh, in a store or something. You can see the store lights in the background. Now, for a catalog shot, those reflections would be pretty distracting. The three rings on the bottom are ones that look like they've had a lot of uh, post work done to the photography. Uh, the one on the bottom left, it looks like they went into Photoshop, uh, took the pen tool, and drew around the ring interior and filled it in with a gradient. Uh, same with the ring on the bottom right. The ring in the center bottom, it looks like they just uh, whited out the ring interior and put a smudge mark in there to look like a reflection and called it a day. So. Basically, uh, this, this type of jewelry requires some sort of post work to get rid of those unwanted reflections. The ring interior is always in the way of, um, of the, the main lighting 
and you just can't avoid it. So when we look at the rendering of our ring, uh, we're going to have to do some some things to to take care of that ring interior as well. Uh, let's talk about our model preparation. Um, what I like to do is avoid some of the the common mistakes that I see in, in ring renderings or jewelry renderings. Um, you don't want what is shown here on the, on the left. Um, this is what I call the CAD look. Uh, this type of model might be okay for manufacturing, but it's not okay for producing a good render. Uh, these sharp flat areas are dead giveaways that we're looking at a CAD model and we want to avoid that. So to avoid that we want to make sure we don't have any perfectly sharp corners. We should add fillets and radius all of our corners. Um, it's a good idea to curve the ring interior even if it's uh, not a comfort fit ring but if it's a pipe fit ring like this one it's still a good idea to add just a very small amount of curvature to that surface and the other thing I like to do is I like to assign multiple materials so even though this ring might all be made of say silver I like to assign a unique material to every area of the ring, the ring interior, uh, the top of the ring, the ring shank, and the reason is that allows us in KeyShot to modify those individual materials to get the best appearance. And finally, I like to isolate the stones. Uh, KeyShot doesn't like it if you've got geometry that intersects with your gemstones. It interferes with the way light reflects. So I like to isolate the, uh, the stones from the rest of the geometry. So I'll show you the model. Again, this is the free model from GradCAD. And what I did is I made a, a couple of modifications to it. Uh, one thing I did was I rebuilt the ring interior so that rather than being flat, we've got some curvature here. So it's a comfort fit ring. Uh, the other thing I did again is I want to isolate the gemstones from any other geometry. In other words, I like to make the stones float in the model and not even touch any other geometry. And the way I do that is I'll pick the uh, large diamond, for example, temporarily increase the size of that diamond by maybe a half a percent, do a Boolean difference, and then reduce the size back to its original size. And that way I'm guaranteed that uh, that stone is not intersecting or touching any of the um, rest of the geometry. And the other thing again is I like to assign a different material to every area of the ring. So even though this ring is platinum, I've actually broken up the surfaces and assigned a unique material. So again, that allows me in KeyShot to make individual adjustments. So let me go here and do an actual uh, import of the ring in KeyShot. And I've got this set up to save some time, but let me go here and do a import. And I'm going to add this to the scene, uh, keep original location and size. 
Uh, my units for import are millimeter because that's how I built the model, or I should say modified the model. Uh, I'm retaining materials because I've brought this model in before, and uh, rather than slow down the webinar by assigning materials, I'm just going to retain materials so it should come in with all the materials pre-assigned. And now I just need to position this, get it approximately where I need it. I think something like that should work. And let's look at the settings tab uh, for the render. What I've done is I've set the ray bounces to 50. Uh, that's because I'm using uh, gemstone materials and ray bounces uh, defines how many times light gets bounced around or light gets calculated inside of that object. So I like to set it up to around 50. Um, if you're not using gemstones, you know, you can knock it down. But for gemstones, I like to use typically 50 for that. Um, on this particular model or scene, I'm not going to use self-shadows. Uh, this particular scene doesn't really need it. Uh, if I set self-shadows on, uh, I get a lot of shadow on the ring interior, which I really want to avoid that. So I'm just going to turn self-shadowing off. I have plenty of shadow. Uh, without that. And um, I've got global illumination turned off because this is really the only object in the scene and I'm not really relying on light uh, coming off of the floor or other objects and it works fine with GI turned off. So that's how I've got the basic settings on that. For my camera, The important number for this scene is the lens setting. I've got the perspective focal length set to 94. Um, I do a lot of macro photography and uh, the setting of 94 in Keyshot pretty well matches what I get off of my Canon macro lens. So uh, for close-up jewelry like this, you know, go from the default 35, uh, knock it up to somewhere between 90 and 100 and you should be in good shape. Let's look at materials for a moment. What I like to do, uh, I start with the default key shot materials. Uh, they're really done very well. The precious metals and gemstones are set up very well in Keyshot. But I always like to look at untouched photos and get an idea of really what I'm shooting for. For example, platinum. People would normally think platinum is very close to silver and you're just going to set up a light gray and call it good. But actually, if you use your eyedropper on this image, um, I find out that platinum really needs to be set so it's more of a taupey color. Um, and in fact, in real life, if you compare platinum next to silver, you'll find out that, that platinum has a very unique tone of its own. So I use real photos as a guideline like this diamond. Uh, everybody has their own impression of what a diamond looks like. It's good just to review on an untouched photo uh, because if you look on the uh, jewelry websites, uh, it's, it's a guarantee that diamonds have all been retouched. So to get back to reality, I like to look at, at the um, actual untouched photo. So getting back to my materials here, 
I just want to show a, a couple of things. Um, the platinum is basically based off of the default uh, key shot material. The gemstones, I've used the default uh, key shot materials. I did something a little different here with the gold. Let me just come in here and show you. I put a texture on this gold. I've got uh, on this top cap here, I'm trying to show gold as sort of a stippled uh, texture. Um, so I use a bump map for that. And I've got a uh, normal map. Um, I think the bump map I used is actually for carpet. Um, you can do a lot of interesting things with bump maps. You don't have to go by what the name is. You can resize them and repurpose them for just about anything. Uh, but the main thing I did on this one is I added for the color property, I added a black and white gradient. And let me show you what it looks like without it. And let me take the bump off. You can see that the gold caps have gone flat. Uh, we've got really flat lighting up there because of the strong lighting hitting the diamond. So in order to give those caps a little interest and a little bit of form, I added the gradient uh, map to the color property. And by adjusting the size and position, I can get the outer areas here to be darker than the center. So it sort of brings the eye in towards the center of that gold area. The other thing I did is I modified uh, the metal material for my ring interior. The issue, again, we have with the ring interior is we're going to get very strong reflections uh, due to our lighting and our environment. And we want to make that so it's not the focal point of the object. So what I did here is I used a uh, anastropic material, metal, uh, to help with the reflections. And then for the texture, I did the same technique. I added a gradient to the color property and specular property. And uh, you'll see once we get the lighting set up how that affects that. But um, Basically, what I'm trying to do is get rid of any strong reflections that are going to hit that ring interior. Um, let me go over here and see if I can grab. Um, there's what the ring interior looks like with a highly polished texture. I get a reflection from the uh, top center of the ring and the gold uh, band there. I get reflections off the HDR environment. And that's highly distractive. So what I did, um, again, is just pick a material that subdues that reflection. It's What I'm doing here is very much what the touch-up artist did on those prior photographs. I'm trying to clean out the uh, ring interior, make it less of a distraction. OK, now let's talk about the lighting. Uh, the model I brought in here uh, just came into the default key shot HDRI, which is a, a really good starting point for most uh, scenes. However, for uh, jewelry, we need something with a bit more punch. Um, this HDRI is pretty much like uh, using a, a light tint for photography or just taking the shot outside on a cloudy day. We need something that's really going to brighten this piece up and give us some good reflections. 
Um, so we're going to go shopping over here for a better HDRI. Uh, the one thing I have found, um, I've built a lot of HDRIs, I've modified a lot of them. What I keep coming back to is, uh, for me anyway, what makes the best HDRI environment for jewelry are the indoor conference room, indoor store, indoor kitchen type of HDRIs. I don't like to use studio HDRIs. I don't like to use outdoor for jewelry. I like to use these indoor HDRIs. And I think the reason they work so well is because you have a lot of light sources. And if you notice uh, in a jewelry store, they don't display their jewelry under a single light source. They use multiple small spotlights to really hit the jewelry from all different angles. And so what I'm going to pick over here for our environment is our Lexion conference room HDRI that comes with Keyshot. So let me just drag that over and you can see the change right away. Uh, it went from a kind of a drab flat lighting to something that looks a little better. But we've got to modify this. Uh, so let's go into our HDRI editor and I'm going to tweak this a little bit. Um, let me go back here first and just hit some basic settings. I think we can get this rotated a little bit better. Um, actually, I think I'll just kind of leave this the same. Let me just go into the editor again. And the nice thing about the Keyshot editor is we can take a HDRI that is sort of working for us and turn it into something that should work really well. The first thing I'm going to do is you can see that we've got a lot of color in this conference room and we're going to desaturate that because I've got a large color cast on the ring that I don't want. So I'm just going to start off by taking my saturation and dragging that down. And I don't want it to go pure black and white. I think that looks a little sterile. I like to leave a little bit of cast in there, but barely. So I'm going to drag saturation down to about 6%. And the other thing I can do is uh, because I don't want any sharp details like these lines that are coming in here, uh, I want to reduce those if I can. So I'm going to take the blur slider and just blur out this HDRI. So that stripped away some of that unwanted detail, but yet left me with some pretty nice reflections. And the other thing I like to do is just when I think I've got a pretty good setup going with the uh, HDRI, I like to take the model and just barely move it and see it, what kind of change we get. See if we can bring out things. Often a one degree change in your model on something like this can make a big difference on how the light reflects. Okay, so for the moment I'm going to call that good. Um, the other thing that you can do is a lot of times the lighting that you get for the uh, jewelry overall is good, but the lighting you get for the main stone is not good. So rather than trying to fight the lighting, one thing you can do is just take the stone and move the part, and I need to be in local mode for this, and I can just rotate that stone around. 
So if the lighting wasn't good to begin with, I might be able to find a better situation just by rotating the stone. So maybe that's how we want it to show up. I think that's a little better than what we started with. So yeah, I, I really like the uh, Keyshot uh, HDRI editor. Uh, it really allows you to take uh, your collection of HDRs and turn them into something much better and bigger. Now the one thing I want to show here is, um, let me open up another um, another example here because I want to show this on a simplified model. <clears throat> here I've got a simple uh, metallic band and I'm using, let's see what environment I'm using. This is really just a basic uh, environment that I found. I don't know where I got this one, but it's just got some basic spotlights on it. And maybe for this purpose, maybe this HDRI is working for me, but I've got one problem area, and that's this reflection or this uh, light glare that I'm getting on this edge on the upper right. And let's say I'm pleased with everything except for this one area, and I'd like to modify that. Well, you can go into your editor. And we could try to mask this with a pin. So let's do that. I'll use the set highlight feature, do a control click on that unwanted spot, and it puts a light pin there. So you might want to play with that and um, make some adjustments. We can change the radius. We can change the brightness. But what I really want to do is mask it. So one idea is, well, what if we take the brightness of our new pin and bring it down, and when you go negative on the brightness, you're turning that light pin into a black pin. It goes dark. So let me drag that over. And that's really not helping me. That's really not um, that's really not hiding that area. It's just creating another black spot. So here's what I like to do instead. I've I've pretty much gotten away from using uh, light pins. Uh, I think if they're overused, they can look a little artificial. So what I like to do instead, let's turn that off. I like to use the uh, copy pins. So you come over here, add copy pin. Now what this does is it allows you to copy paste an area within your HDRI onto another area of the HDRI. So basically it allows you to modify your environment and so I'm just going to drag this over to this subtle spotlight here and change the radius down and click call it good. So now I've copied that area and you can see it here on the editor I now have a duplicate of that area and what I'll do is I'll drag it up to my problem area. And I can increase the brightness.
And now I've taken that trouble area, let me turn the pin off, I've got that bright unwanted area, turn the copy pin back on, does a better job of masking it, but I can take it further. I'm going to change this copy pin from circular to rectangular. And let's see what we can do here. I'll just move it around and get get a better effect with that. And I've actually got the one that I played with already set up. This is my copy pin that I've put in that area. Let me turn all the pins off. These are all copy pins I'm using. So let me turn them all off. This is what my basic HDR, HDRI gave me on this model. And so you can see I needed some lighting at the bottom. I needed some lighting on the right edge. I needed to fix this little unwanted spot here. So with these three copy lights, I'm able to get a much better result on my model. So again, uh, I've sort of steered away from using just the regular uh, light pins. They work well, I think, for uh, small highlights and things like that. But uh, if you're doing any sort of broad lighting, uh, experiment with copy pins because I think it's a, it's a great feature and it allows you, again, to take your HDRI and turn it into something that's um, you know extremely usable. Okay, well, I'm going to go back now that we've uh, talked about copy lights. And come back to our main uh, scene here. And I want to talk a little bit about reflections. Now this image is showing how reflectors are used by photographers when they're photographing uh, small objects. Uh, you can use color reflectors. You can use lights. Uh, you can use uh, you know, what they call bounce cards, just white reflective surfaces. And in the top row, you can see what effect those have on the subject. So modifying your existing uh, environment doesn't have to mean going in and editing the HDRI. It can mean adding an external reflector uh, to the scene. And I did that on, on this model. Uh, let me go to the scene here, to the scene tree. And I think I've got my camera unlocked. So let me zoom out. And you can see I've got some extra stuff in this scene. What I did is I went to the... Uh, key shot geometry and brought in two flat disks. And you can see one's fairly close to the ring, one is way out there. And these are reflectors that are pretty much like we just showed for the photographers. And what I'm doing here is I'm 
casting a reflection back onto the ring uh, that gives me a lot of control that I don't have using the HDRI alone. So let me just pick this one and show you what the material looks like. It's simply um, an image that I applied to the color property. And just about any image will do. I think this one was just taken. Uh, it's called Lobby. This one was actually a copy uh, of an HDRI, but it can be any image that has some light spots, dark spots, and I applied it to the disk. And that's going to reflect back, and it's going to give me a lot of control because I can take this uh, image and I can size it, I can rotate it, I can change the brightness, and all of that is independent of the HDRI. So I have a lot of control here. The overall uh, object here is I'm using the emissive material. And the reason I'm using the emissive material is because mainly it has this property uh, visible to camera. If I take that off, my disk disappears, but it still reacts as far as the lighting is concerned. It just makes it invisible to my main camera. In this scene, I left it on because it's out of camera range anyway. So setting up reflectors like this is a very powerful tool. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. And let me show you what the scene looks like without the reflectors. I only use two of them here, and I'll turn them both off. Okay, so with the reflectors off, uh, one of the issues I have is I've got some unwanted dark spots going on here on the edge of the ring, and I'd like to be able to manipulate that. So again, using the reflectors, there it's off there it's on. And you can see what a difference it makes just on that surface. And then the other reflector was to throw some light into this right side area of the ring. So reflector on, reflector off, back on. So if I was to try to get that same effect by manipulating the HDRI, it could take a lot of work. But using reflectors, I can manipulate the position, the size, the rotation of that image, uh, the brightness, and I can get a lot of uh, control on, on those reflections. Um, so in my main... Uh, image, my final output, I think I used three reflectors and about five copy pins to get this result. And uh, of course, for your model, it's going to be different. Every, every situation is going to be different. But uh, I like to start again with a good indoor HDRI. I like to add copy pins to modify it, and to really fine tune it, I like to add my external reflectors, and that's, that's the result I got with that. Now the final thing I want to talk about is the post-production. Okay, this is, let's see, yeah, this is our post-production. Let me bring that up. Okay, this is my output from Keyshot. This is my render. And 
when I render, I always render a clown pass. And a clown pass is basically assigning a unique flat color to every section of your ring or your object. And what that allows you to do is use the Photoshop magic wand. We need to be on that layer. We can use the magic wand and pick different areas on our render. So if I want to pick the um, diamond, that's all I have to do. If I want to work on the ring interior, that's all I have to do. Uh, so basically uh, what you do is when you pick these areas, you're going to pick one of the Photoshop modifiers and alter, uh, say, the contrast or alter the uh, brightness, uh, clarity, sharpness. It allows you to work on individual areas. So what I'm going to do is just briefly take you through a, a post-production uh, scenario here. And again, this is my uh, render out of Keyshot with the clown pass, no modifications done yet. Uh, what I like to use is uh, a Photoshop plugin uh, sold by Google. It's called Viviza, and it's part of the NIC uh, collection of Photoshop uh, filters by Google. I know a lot of people don't like to use uh, plugins because they think it takes away their control, but um, I like them because they're fast, and as far as I'm concerned, they do give you a lot of control. And uh, I just want to take you through a, a quick look at this. Uh, what I'm going to do first, let me, uh, let me cancel this. What I'm going to do first is go over here and pick the um, gold areas and use shift key to make multiple selections. I'm going to pick my stones. And I will go to select inverse. And that should give me just those areas. Uh, let's see. Let me do that again. I'll pick the gold. Oh, always forget to do that. I need to be on the correct Okay. We'll pick the gold. Oh, did it again.
Okay, I tell you what, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go right in here because I want to get through this. This is the Google um, plugin by Visa, and I'm going to change uh, some of the parameters here uh, to see what we can do to modify our our model here. Uh, I'm going to change the brightness up just a little bit. Uh, I think I'll bring the contrast up a little bit. Uh, saturation, I'll drop it down just a, a little bit. Uh, the structure will bring out some clarity in the render. Uh, I'll drop the shadow down. And the warmth, I'm going to take it negative a little bit just to give us a little bit of a cool uh, tone to the metal there. And we'll just hit OK on that. And then the other thing I can do is uh, I can just um, Let's see here. I can take my diamond, and I'd like to brighten that diamond up a little bit. So for that, I'm going to use just the normal uh, Photoshop tools. And I'll go up here to, um, I'll just do an image. Um, I'm sorry, I need to be on the right layer. I'll go to Image, Adjustments. And I think I'll take the saturation and bring that down quite a bit. And the other thing I want to do to give that diamond some clarity is um, I'll go to Image Adjustments and I th I'll go to Exposure and just bring that exposure up just a little bit like that. So let me take the layer off here. You can see there's my original render out of Keyshot and by using the uh, Google filters and a little bit of key uh, a little bit of Photoshop adjustments, I can get that kind of a result. And you know, everybody can decide for themselves how far they want to take it. Uh, there's no right or wrong result. Uh, what you do for a catalog might be different than what you do for, uh, say, a magazine cover. Uh, but this is just to show you some of the uh, techniques, some of the tools that are available uh, that you can add some extra um, interest and sharpness uh, to your model. So I think we're about five minutes uh, left in the uh, webinar, guys. So if we want to uh, go to some questions, we can. I think uh, everyone was pretty much mesmerized the whole time. That, that was wonderful. Uh, uh, not very many uh, questions. There was uh, one person wanting to uh, find out a little bit more about the brushed metal texture on that band uh, that you uh, showed and, and how you got that appearance. Okay, sure. Um, let's go there. I'll just do material, edit material, and let's see what we have. Okay, this is starting off as a, a metal. Uh, I think I use just, you know, starting off with a basic uh, glossy metal, uh, probably platinum or titanium, glossy, polished. Um, the brushed texture is going to come in over here. 
And on this one, I've got a color map and a bump map. And uh, from the name of it, brushed metal photog uh, photo, um, I'm pretty sure what I used there on this one for those uh, maps were actual photographs of brushed metal. And you can find that on the web generally. Um, you can usually find some close-up photographs uh, by searching Google Images. And uh, I believe what I did on this one is I found something uh, that was brushed metal. I enlarged it. I cropped it and just saved them out as uh, uh, ping images. And um, so I used one for the color, one for the bump. So let's turn the bump off. Uh, the bump, in this case, doesn't add a lot, but it adds just enough to give it a, a little bit of a 3D effect. And then the color without is simply a, uh, a metal with the um, gloss uh, turned down. Now I think on a lot of systems where it says gloss on mine, it might say roughness on yours. There's a key shot preference to change this. Uh, I believe gloss is simply the inverse of roughness. And because I work with shiny metals a lot, uh, the gloss control gives me a, a much better control. So my preferences are set up to show this as gloss. Yours might be roughness. So again, um, setting up your materials is often uh, just a lot of experimentation. Um, you know, you can do a lot by taking a photograph and applying it as a color map uh, and as a bump map, and then adjusting your variables down here, the size, the position, the mapping, and so forth, uh, to get the result that you want. OK, great. Uh, well, we don't have uh, any, any other questions so far. Um, so uh, thank you, Ed. That was uh, really informative. We've uh, had some good comments on it already. Um, we will make this webinar available. Uh, it will be on keyshot.com in the learning section. And we'll also have it on our YouTube uh, channel under the webinars playlist. And we'll have that up uh, within the week. So thank you uh, again, Ed. All right. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys.